Welcome everyone to the third Binance Academy webinar. So we're going to start now. <clears throat> Today we're going to talk about uh, mistakes to avoid in technical analysis and using Bitcoin privately. And we'll also have the usual Q&A section at the end. So before we start, as usual, if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll try to answer them at the end. So let's dive in. I'm going to be talking about trading mistakes. So the basics of technical analysis are actually relatively easy to grasp. You have to put in the time, of course, but if you do, you'll get a solid framework for analyzing the financial markets. And side note, we do have a lot of beginner focused trading content on Binance Academy, so check them out if you haven't. So with that said, execution is a completely different domain than analysis. So when you're starting out, you'll likely make a lot of mistakes. Now, if you're not careful, you can really quickly blow up your account, which obviously is an ideal. You can learn from those mistakes, but we're going to talk about some of the most obvious ones that you can try to avoid. Okay, first one, not cutting losses. So this may be the most important mistake to avoid, and it's done by a lot of beginners. Here's a quote from commodities trader at Saikota. The elements of good trading are one, cutting losses, two, cutting losses, and three, cutting losses. If you can follow these three rules, you may have a chance. This may seem like a simple step, but it's crucial. If you don't cut losses, even a single loss can destroy your capital base. And you need to keep in mind that when you're starting out, the first step isn't necessarily to win, it's to not lose. So be aware of position sizing and define risk for each of your positions. And of course, always use a stop loss. You could of course also try out paper trading, which is essentially simulated trading with funds that aren't real. And this way you can test out strategies without risking your hard earned funds. Um, so you can try out paper trading on the Binance Futures testnet, for example. Okay, second one, over trading. So especially if you're going for a more active trading strategy, you may feel that you should be in a trade all the time. That may not be the best idea. A lot of trading involves sitting around patiently waiting for the trade opportunities to present themselves. Some very successful traders will only enter a few trades per year and still do really well. So if you enter a lot of positions just for the sake of it, you may chip away at your funds and have less to deploy when an opportunity actually presents itself. And of course, keep in mind that markets are in a constant state of change. What works in one part of a market cycle may be completely useless in another. This is why it's important to observe what's going on and adapt to it. So one other thing you can do to potentially avoid overtrading is zooming out. It's quite easy to get lost in lower time frames and try to trade smaller moves and get chopped up by what is essentially market noise. If you enter based on signals coming from higher time frames, you can have higher conviction in your trading. Third one, revenge trading. Now, this is also a very common one, and it's understandable why it happens, but it should be avoided. So what is revenge trading? It's when a trader immediately wants to make back a significant loss. Usually what happens, however, is that they amass an even bigger loss. No one can really make great trading decisions when they're emotional, and this is why revenge trading usually leads to even more losses. Technical analysis requires an analytical approach. So if you're emotional, you won't be able to maintain that analytical approach that is required. So what can you do to avoid revenge trading? Well, many traders won't trade at all for a predefined period of time after a big loss. This might just be one day, a couple days, maybe even weeks, depending on their individual strategy. The point is that they take a break and try and get back to the markets with a fresh outlook so they can make better decisions. Next one, 
being too stubborn to change your mind. So an important concept to learn when it comes to trading is that you don't have to be right all the time. In fact, you're guaranteed to be wrong at least some of the time. Even the best traders aren't right all the time. As a matter of fact, they may actually be wrong more than they are right and still be profitable because of their overall trading strategy. So I've mentioned earlier that markets are constantly changing and your job as a trader or investor is to observe those changes and adapt to them. If you're really rigid in your opinions and are unwilling to change them, it's likely that you won't be able to make the best investment decisions. So here's another quote from Paul Tudor Jones. Um, Every day I assume every position I have is wrong. This just means that he's constantly looking for valid ways to contradict his opinion, to contradict his opinions and biases. And that's really useful when it comes to trading and investment. Okay, next one, ignoring extreme market conditions. So there are times when technical analysis becomes less reliable. These usually happen around black swan events or some other liquidity event that results in market conditions where the usual rules don't really apply. In such times, trying to use the usual framework for market analysis is likely not going to work out great. These times can correlate with extreme readings on indicators, unreasonable moves, both to the upside and to the downside, and TA can essentially be thrown out the window. So what can you do in such conditions? Well, probably the best thing to do is absolutely nothing. If the markets are hard to read, your usual risk framework is out of the window as well. So you need to identify what's happening and decide whether it makes sense to trade in such an environment. Okay, next one is forgetting that TA is a game of probabilities. So this one is somewhat related to the previous point in that technical analysis isn't an exact science. It's basically a framework to think about market structure, manage risk, but the ideas behind TA are in some scientific principles or physical laws. Therefore, there are never guarantees, only probabilities, and the market isn't guaranteed to behave in a way that you expect, and you should prepare for all scenarios. So if you become too confident, there's a risk that you oversize You don't manage risk in the necessary way and you blow up your account by betting big on what you think is a certain outcome. So always keep in mind that TA is a game of probabilities and never certainties. And the last one is blindly following other traders. So one of the best ways to learn about trading is of course from other people who have already gone your path. And of course, you constantly need to improve. I mean, this is true for basically any skill. It's nice to get better and better over time. And continually changing market conditions will make it a necessity for you, actually. However, if you really want to be successful in trading, you need to be able to form your own opinions of the market. If you're following trading signals from other traders and you don't know why they are entering that particular setup, you likely won't do well over the long run. So you need to understand why a particular setup makes sense. And even then, you don't know their individual trading strategy. So a particular trading setup might work great in one strategy and might be completely wrong in another. And actually, successful traders will wildly disagree with each other in their analysis. And that's perfectly fine because there are a myriad of ways to generate profit. And they're simply using different ways. So you need to find your own way to do that. And this, of course, doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to learn from other traders. It just means that evaluate what you can learn from them and adapt to your own strategy. All right, so that concludes this part. So on the left, you can see the article that we've discussed here. And on the right, uh, we have quite a long, uh, complete guide to cryptocurrency trading, which contains quite a lot about trading and it will if you're starting out it's it's a great place to learn about all this but now we're going to move on and discuss using bitcoin privately
How's it going, everyone? Uh, as my colleague said, I'll be talking to you about how to use Bitcoin privately. So let's start by reiterating the, Bit the Bitcoin blockchain is public. So anyone could see the source of funds, the amount being sent, and the destination for every single transaction going all the way back to the beginning. Um, now, Bitcoin is pseudonymous, and in that sense, it gives you a weak bit of privacy, uh, as your name isn't, attra isn't attached to each of your transactions. Uh, but chain analysis can correlate your activity with other information, uh, such as you know IP addresses, uh, accounts on Bitcoin-related platforms that they might get a hold of in order to de-anonymize you. So there are ways to make your experience more pr private with Bitcoin, and uh, that's what we'll be discussing today. So broadly speaking, those methods uh, that we're going to look at are no KYC acquisition, holding your own keys and avoiding address reuse, using your own node, and mixing your coins. Let's dive in. So let me uh, preface this section by saying that KYC, uh, know your customer regulations, they're fine for most people. Uh, in fact, you know, some even prefer it as it gives you an extra layer of security for recovering your account. Um, I'm only going to discuss scenarios where your threat model is such that you absolutely need to obtain coins without leaking too much information. So anyways, first and second rules of using Bitcoin privately are you do not talk about Bitcoin. This goes for the meat space, so telling other people that you own Bitcoin, for example, but also for the digital space, telling online third parties that you own Bitcoin. Obviously, you need to include your transactions in the blockchain at some stage, but any other information should be kept to a minimum. So centralized exchanges and services, uh, they need to perform their due diligence uh, so that they can make sure that customers aren't involved in stuff like, uh, you know, illegal activities, money laundering, fraud, that kind of thing. Um, and this is often a legal requirement for any institution that's selling cryptocurrencies or any other kind of financial asset. So unfortunately for uh, those that value their privacy, it also means that uh, these same services will gain access to a lot of your personal information. You know, such as your your real identity, identity documents, uh, and they might know where your home address is, and of course they'll also know stuff like uh, when you're buying Bitcoin, how much you're buying, and what addresses you're withdrawing your funds to afterwards. So once again, it boils down to your threat model, uh, but you do open yourself up to some counterparty risk in this manner. So a service could be hacked, uh, your identity could be exposed or they could be selling data to advertisers or malicious actors. So if that level of risk is unacceptable to you, there are alternative ways of obtaining coins. And the first one is mining. Uh, so by dedicating electricity and hardware to secure in the network, you can earn a block reward. Uh, but nowadays it's more common for people to work together in mining pools, uh, just so they can combine their hash power and then they'll split up the reward between themselves. Uh, you could accept Bitcoin for goods and services. So say you run an e-commerce store, uh, you take it as payment for products. Uh, if you run a consultancy or something like that, you could accept it for your services. Uh, that way you sidestep any middlemen. And of course, you also just have peer-to-peer -peer transactions uh, where you match with someone looking to sell Bitcoin for cash. You meet up, they send you the coins, you hand them the cash, and everybody's happy. All right, let's talk a bit about uh, storage. So even even... If you don't have KYC, a custodial service, uh, that is to say one that holds your coins for you, uh, can glean sensitive information and tie together all of your transactions. So a wallet that doesn't require you to create an account and instead generates private keys on your device is the best. So on the topic of address reuse, uh, which is you know simply reusing the same receiving address, uh, the blockchain is public. You wouldn't reveal your bank balance to a barista at a coffee shop when you're buying I don't know, a pumpkin spice latte. So why should you do the same thing with Bitcoin? You put yourself at risk by exposing the amount you hold. Um, now, accidental address reuse isn't as prevalent nowadays uh, with the popularity of something called a hierarchical deterministic or more simply a HD wallet. So these will allow you to take a seed. Uh, you know, if you've ever made a wallet, those will be the 12 or 24 word phrases that uh, you'll no doubt be familiar with. And from those, you can generate a limitless amount of addresses. Well, sorry, it's not it's not limitless, uh, but you know the, the the upper bound is so high that you probably wouldn't get to it in your lifetime. Um, nonetheless, even with these measures in place, you should be aware 
of address reuse and just uh, you know be conscious when handing out your address because it can harm your privacy. Uh, if you give the same address to your friends, you know Alice and Bob, and then both Alice and Bob uh, will be able to see that someone else paid you. They won't know that it's you know the other friend, but they will be able to see the amount. So a couple of tips on this front: uh, use one address per transaction, use a HD wallet. I'm not going to rec recommend one in particular, uh, but if you do your own research, you know there's plenty of them out there. They all kind of suit different use cases. And lastly. Uh, don't share your extended public key, which is what you get uh, in a HD wallet that allows you to generate, uh, you know, all these new addresses each time. If someone else gets that extended public key, they can start to generate those same addresses and they can tie together all the addresses that you own. Right. Let's move on to nodes. So. Let's, uh, let's just assume that you followed you know, the steps we've kind of outlined so far. You've obtained your Bitcoins by buying them for cash, and you've loaded them onto a smartphone wallet where you hold your own keys. You'd think by now that everything will be private. Um, unfortunately not. You've eliminated a lot of risk here, but privacy is, uh, you know, it's very, it requires a multi-layered approach. The consumer smartphone wallets are what we call light clients, Simplified payment verification clients, or simply SPV clients. So they don't store a full copy of the blockchain, uh, you know, which is by design, uh, so that you don't have to hold 300 gigabytes of blocks on your device. Uh, but it does mean that you need to ask someone else to tell you when your transactions uh, have been made to your address. You have no way of verifying it independently. Um, but then, so if you say to a service, could you tell me how much this address has in it? That tells them A, your IP address, and B, that you're interested in uh, that particular address. And you know, they can they can kind of say with reasonable certainty, okay, maybe this person owns that address. So they get around that uh, to an extent. Like clients today use something called a Bloom filter. Uh, I won't go into how they work here, but we do have a glossary page on the Academy site if you want to learn more about them. For now, think of them like uh, massive lists of addresses. Uh, that you will hide your address inside. So you send that full list to a server. Uh, the server will return information about every single one of those addresses so that they don't know exactly which one is yours. Uh, you know, it could be anything on that list. Uh, as you can imagine, that's still, that's still pretty weak on the privacy front. So for absolute maximum confidentiality, you need to run a full node. And what that'll do is it will keep a full copy of the blockchain that you can query yourself without leaking information to anyone else. It's like your own private server. Um, the best uh, analogy I can think of for that is if you go onto Wikipedia and you decide to look up, I don't know, honey badgers, Wikipedia is going to know that someone at your IP address asked for that page. On the other hand, if you download uh, you know, every single page on Wikipedia onto your local storage, you can then look up that page offline, and Wikipedia is not going to have any idea that you did that. So that's it in a nutshell. Uh, for added points when running Node, you can set it up as a hidden Tor service so that your IP is hidden from other peers. All right, lastly, let's uh, talk about coin mixing. So as we said, uh, every, every transaction that you look at on the blockchain, you can tell, uh, you can tell, you know, the address amounts, uh, source, destination, but you can also tell what transactions coins go on to be used in. So, you know, you can look at 2009, you can see Satoshi's addresses, you can see Hal's uh, and any others from that period. And you can also tell uh, when those coins have been spent, where they've been, what address they've been spent to. Um, so you have this kind of chain of digital signatures. Uh, so for whatever reason, you might want to break that, that chain. Uh, you know, between your past and your future transactions. An example of this is if you buy coins from an entity that knows your identity, uh, you could kind of obfuscate where they're going, and that entity would have a much harder time, uh, you know, following them in the future. So you could do this by using a coin mixer, which is a service that you send your coins to. Uh, they send back new coins minus a small fee. The coins that you sent and the coins that you've then received are totally separate. Um, you know, they're not connected to each other on the blockchain, so the link is broken. Uh, these aren't really recommended mixing methods anymore. Uh, you need to trust someone 
you know, to perform the exchange that could just run off of your funds. Uh, and they'll still be able to tie the two sets of transactions together themselves and they could sell that information to other people. Coin joint software, on the other hand, uh, that's it's trustless and it's increasingly user friendly. Uh, there's a handful of options you can pick from now, uh, relatively straightforward to use, and you eliminate that third party risk. So, coin join is a bit like a black box on the blockchain. You will collaborate with, let's say, four other people to craft a transaction that takes equal amounts from all of you. So, each of you put in uh, half a Bitcoin each. So, you have five inputs going into that transaction. And then the transaction kind of merges them together. And on the other side, it puts out five outputs of uh, a matching amount. And so you have no way with this, uh, since the transaction has kind of merged these, uh, to tell which input maps to which output. And there's no way that anyone looking at the blockchain could tell. So at best, they could say one of the people that owned one of the inputs owns one of these outputs. So the more coin joins you kind of chain along with each other dramatically increases, uh, you know, the, the linkability. Um, so the analogy I like to use uh, to kind of bring us back to a real life example is if you and four other friends had uh, identical one euro coins. And so you take these one euro coins, you put them in a bag, you shake the bag, and then you each retrieve a coin. Well, each of you you know, still has one euro, you still have that value. Uh, none of you has any way of knowing wh uh, which person the coin originally belonged to. So this is a very interesting technology. You know, I've gone over it in very broad strokes here. But if you check out the article on the next slide, you can learn a bit more. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. I believe we'll now move over to the questions. All right, awesome. So we also have two Telegram groups. One of them is where we can chat. And the other one is just uh, announcements that happen in the Binance ecosystem. So we do actually have two questions already from Twitter. So we can maybe start with those and then see if there are uh, any more questions. All right, so the first one is from Diane Adriana Soutedia. Um, so three, three big problems in my trading style. Emotional based trading, lack of time horizon, and trade size are not consistent. Can you give me tips to solve that problem? Okay, so uh, yes, the emotional based trading is, is kind of a difficult one. So, you know, emotional decisions generally should be avoided when you're trading because they can really cloud your judgment and what is really ideal is that you you have a clear head and you can make good calm decisions um so you what can you do to avoid uh, emotional decisions where when you're emotional maybe it's best not to make trading decisions and then just get back to the markets when when you are feeling a bit more clear-headed. So next one is lack of time horizon. So this is an interesting one. So if you identify a trade setup on a certain time frame, then, then um, it's best to stick to analysis on that time frame. So, you know, let's say you identify a trade setup on the four hour chart then then when you're monitoring the trade it's best to look at the four hour chart at the same time and because if you if you start looking at other time frames that that can really uh, mess with your original trade idea so try to try to maintain consist consistency in your time frames you can of course get more details by zooming in or zooming out but the decisions primarily should be made on the same time frame that the sa that the trade setup was identified in. And the third one is trade size. 
So we actually have an article about this called how to calculate position size in trading and that outlines a formula that you can use to calculate your position sizes. So position size calculation shouldn't be based on just you saying that I'm going to put this amount in this position. It's, it should be calculated based on how much of your trading account you want to risk and how far your stop loss is from your entry. And so you define all these things in advance and then you can calculate your position size for each trade. And then you will know that in the worst case scenario, how much of your account can you lose in an individual trade? And then you can potentially avoid big losses because your risk, your downside risk will always be managed. So these are the tips that I can give you. We had another one there on Twitter from, uh, sorry if I'm mispronouncing this, Thea Grajan. Uh, total supply, circulation, supply, and token burning, uh, how are they correlated with price action in the market? Um, honestly, it, it kind of depends. You know, the idea with a total supply, a finite one, is that there's this idea of artificial scarcity. Um, the circulating supply, uh, you know, is the amount that's currently available. And then the token burning uh, is generally done, you know, well, when token burning is used uh, in most contexts, you know, it refers to the issue burning off their own reserves. And what that does is it puts the tokens out of circulation. So it effectively lowers the total supply. Um, but as far as a price action goes, there's not a very clear correlation to my knowledge, uh, you know, of how these events tie in. Yeah, I think a kind of a common misconception about this is that let's say you have a blockchain with a hundred coins, like let's say that your total supply and they are each worth $1. So the market cap of this network would be a hundred dollars. And so let's say we burn half of that supply. So now we have 50 units. Um, and I think, uh, I mean, it, it would be logical to think that, okay, so now we took those 50 out of the total supply. So now the remaining 50 should be worth $2 each, but that's not, not a direct cor correlation like that. It's, the, the pricing uh, is still done by, you know, the forces of the market, essentially. So it's not immediately going to jump to $2. I mean, maybe the price will go up just because this is a known event that 50 of the supply would be burned, but still it's, it's not a direct correlation. Yeah. So question here now on YouTube from Mickey C. When we give others our wallet address, can someone hack into our wallet? No. So uh, you have a private key and you have a public key. The public key is then uh, you, you do some like some one one way math on that uh, that makes it hard to get the, the public key. But even if someone has a public key, uh, again, you have a kind of one way function that will turn your private key into a public key. Um, so it's very easy to calculate a public key from a private key, but not vice versa. And then your public address, which is uh, taken from your public key, is also put through a one-way function. So it's very, you know, in this day and age, unless something like quantum computing comes along, uh, you know, it's it's very, very, very difficult. And, you know, many would say technically impossible. So, uh, yeah, sorry to answer your follow-up question. It is very safe to give uh, other people your your wallet address. In fact, you know, that's that's how these systems work. You have to hand that out. Follow-up question here from uh, Alex. What's the difference between coin joins and coin mixing? Um, 
you know, technically, coin mixing could apply to both the centralized mixers uh, that I spoke about and, you know, the coin join uh, concept. But uh, typically, when you're speaking about coin mixing, um, although I suppose it's changing a lot with uh, some of the more recent coin join technologies, but, it, you know, typically it used to be that coin mixers were the centralized ones. Uh, coin joins were, you know, the ones where you combine your inputs on chain. Okay, so the next question is, can you help me on where to take profit during parabolic price rise? Um, well, that really depends on the individual setup. And as we, as we talked about it earlier, it's very difficult to, um, to kind of predict these or even project these kinds of things. Uh, especially in extreme conditions when there is a parabolic rise because usual technicals or even fundamentals are kind of thrown out the window. So it's, it's, um, it's hard to tell. So when, when, um, when something is at an all time high, for example, uh, some traders will use, uh, Fibonacci tools to look for extensions based on previous market structure. So they, they look for some type of structure that they could pin the two points of a Fibonacci retracement tool to, and then they use values that are higher than one, which are extensions of that structure, which is, I mean, the most, there's a lot, but the most common ones are like the one, 1 1.618, 1.272, I think the 2.618, things like that. Usually it's, it's in the trading software. And so what some traders will do is that they will look for these Fibonacci extensions and then they exit some of their positions or take profit at these Fibonacci extension levels. Is it safer to store crypto on exchanges, hardware wallet, or desktop wallet? Um, you know, it's not, it's, there's not really a one-size-fits-all answer here. Uh, you know, if you store on an exchange, you, uh, you do have some counterparty risk, but it's also much easier to recover your account if you lose, uh, you know, if you forget your password. If you use, uh, like, a hardware wallet and you forget your PIN code or your seed when you're trying to back it up, uh, your funds are gone. Um, so hardware wallets are, you know, they have less attack vectors, um, but they are a bit more cumbersome to use. Uh, exchanges, you know, are the, probably the best for you to use if you're, you know, trading, staking, lending, that kind of thing. Uh, and desktop wallets, you know, if you're making payments uh, are, you know, a lot more convenient than hardware wallets. So most people, I think, would typically use a mix of them. Um, hardware wallets are gen generally seen as the kind of, you know, safes that you would keep your, the bulk of your holdings in and exchanges and desktop wallets, you know, the funds that you're actively using. Okay. Harold Kim asks, is it only CZ who decides and knows which coins are to be added on Binance? No. So there is, as far as I know, there is a listing team or there are people who um, look into projects and through one way or another, they do their research and decide which coins to list. But it's, um, you know, it's a complicated process. Nazmul Hussain, my question, how to safe trading? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a, it's quite a, a lengthy topic. Uh, we do have a lot of articles on the site that I recommend you familiarize yourself with. And if you have any, you know, specific questions, uh, afterwards, feel free to ask them in the Binance Academy chat. Harold Kim is coin mixed and coin joined BTC more secure than private coins such as Monero. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't talk about this in terms of security. Uh, I can't really 
comment uh, on the actual security of it. But uh, as far as I know, Monero is what you would call private by default. So every single transaction in Monero uh, has that plausible deniability. Um, if you look at a blockchain explorer at a specific transaction, you can tell whether it's a coin joint transaction or not. So uh, the Monero ledger and you know other privacy coins, they have a kind of blacked out ledger. So I would say that's that's more private in that sense. <clears throat> uh, but you know, like if you if you mix Bitcoin effectively, uh, it's very very difficult for someone to. Uh, you know, connect the inputs and the outputs, provided, of course, you take the right steps afterwards. Okay, follow-up question. On Fibonacci trend-based extension, what are the good levels to take profit? Um, so I was actually talking about the, the Fibonacci retracement tool. Um, but generally, I mean, it's very hard to, to, I mean, it's basically just guessing at that point because there aren't any usual technical requirements or they're, they're, the usual technical framework just doesn't really work. Um, and what something else you can also look at is sort of a psychological resistance level. So if the price is coming close to round numbers, for example, those are usually uh, areas of resistance because this is how human psychology works, that we like to think about the uh, the world in ways that we can understand it, and then round numbers are sort of easier to comprehend. And so if, you know, if Bitcoin is going close to $10,000, then there's this additional effect there that that is also in play but in terms of the extension levels it's yeah i think it's 1.618 2.618 3.618 also the 0.5 extension so 1.5 2.5 the 272s 382s um so if you go to our fibonacci retracement tool article that also contains a bunch of them All right, why why are we not listing energy coin? Uh, we don't have any say in what gets listed or not. We make content for Binance Academy, so that's not for us to decide. Uh, so it's from Diane again, or Diane, sorry, probably don't say that correctly. Um, one of my favorite trade in Binance is future trade. Can you explain here what advantage, advantage and disadvantage of leverage, how to control? So, um, so leverage is, <laughs> it can be very risky. So you really need to understand the risks of trading with leverage. And the basic idea is that the higher leverage you, you use, the closer, I mean, the the easier it is to liquidate your position, essentially. So, um, which is a point where your entire original collateral that you put up to enter a position is liquidated on the market and you lose some of it or all of that amount. And so the higher leverage you use, the the more funds you are borrowing from from another party, which is in, in this case, it's the exchange itself. And so let's say you're using 2x leverage. That means that if the, if the price of, of that asset drops 50%, then you get liquidated because that's the point where the, the lender of those funds would start uh, losing money on their landed amount and they obviously not going to take that risk so they liquidate the part that is your position so that was 2x leverage so if you use 10x leverage then the amount that you put up is 
now much smaller. So if the market goes down around 10%, then you're at that same level again where the, the collateral amount that you put up is now all gone. So again, the, the counterparty is not going to take that risk that they lose what they lend it to you, so they liquidate your position. And so that's really the disadvantage that you really need to be caref careful with leverage because, because you can lose much more than on a normal position. Now the advantage of leverage is that you can be more efficient with what you have. So you, you can keep less on the exchange because you can utilize leverage and, and so you can use your funds more effectively. <clears throat> and you can, of course, if you don't have that much, then you can take bigger positions than you could otherwise. So these are the advantages. What do exchanges use for cold storage? Do they rely on companies like Ledger, Trezor, like us? Um, possibly. Uh, I'm not familiar with any exchange's specific cold storage strategy, but uh, you know, generally they will use something. Um, so you know, stuff like Ledger and Trezor and other consumer hardware wallets, uh, what those are are basically very uh, simplistic computers that don't connect to the internet. So you could you could get the same effect by having you know a laptop that's never been connected to the internet with its with its wireless card stripped out and kept in something like a Faraday cage. So I would assume that uh, if they don't use you know the hardware wallets we know, they would probably use a setup like that or maybe even something like the Glacier Protocol. Um, okay, so follow-up question to the leverage one, control leverage to make profit. So something you also need to understand is you can't really adjust the leverage in after you enter a position in the way that you think. You can adjust the leverage by adding or removing collateral. So that's how you can you can adjust your leverage effectively after you have already opened the position. So we have another question by Harold Kim. Thank you very much for these sessions, lads. I really appreciate the valuable info. May I ask whether you guys are also personally bullish on the future of DeFi projects? Um, I am personally like very interested in DeFi. I, uh, <laughs> I've, I've actually been keeping a fairly close eye on it for a while because I think it's a, it's a really cool way to interact with these networks. And I just find this idea of composability amazing. I think, you know, just the fact that projects like these DeFi projects can collaborate with each other without knowing each other or without actually deciding that they want to collaborate just because they're all using the same public blockchain ecosystem and that in inherently brings with it the fact that they are very interoperable with each other and they can sort of be used as different building blocks to create new applications. So for me personally, the most interesting aspect of DeFi is, is this idea that we don't really know what kind of applications will come out of it just because it's kind of this modular uh, ecosystem in a way where each component does something relatively simple or or does something that other modules, I guess, don't do. And then together they create something really, really complex. And so, yes, we are keeping an eye on DeFi and it's great. We've just had a, a question come through on Twitter there. Uh, what does Safu mean? 
Safu is, uh, you know, it's kind of a meme at this point. Um, it was originally made, uh, or a video was released called Funds or Safu. Um, and so from there, you know, it became a meme widely adopted in the crypto space. Uh, and then it's also the name now of Binance's emergency insurance fund standing for secure asset fund for users. All right, so next one, what's the difference between cross and isolated on futures? And I also, I realized we skipped the question just before that, which was relating to uh, also this topic about cross and isolated margin. So cross margin is when you have uh, funds in your account and they collateralize all your margin or futures positions, essentially. And isolated margin, it allows you to isolate certain parts of your funds to individual positions. So if you want to minimize what the possible amount, like the highest possible amount that you can lose in a single position, then you can use isolated margin. And then you will know that only that collateral amount is uh, dedicated to a certain position. While in cross margin, your entire collateral or margin is essentially at risk, or it could be liquidated if all your positions really go against you. So isolated margin is basically a way to manage risk in a more defined way than cross margin. Well, I mean, it really depends on your strategy, but, um, but yes, an isolated margin allows you to to minimize or to define an amount that you are willing to lose for an individual position. Yeah, on the, on the topic of strategies, the next question, if I buy some coins, uh, it's going to dip or when I sell the coin, it pumps. Um, how to solve this problem? Uh, you know, learn, learn how to trade. You know, we have plenty of articles, uh, you know, learn about technical indicators, uh, fundamental analysis, and, you know, like we can't really tell you how to develop your own strategy. It's something you would need to do yourself, but, uh, you know, the resources are on the website. <laughs> yes, so... So that's my big problem. Sometimes my trade liquidity and I lose my money. So <laughs> yes, I mean, uh, if, if you're not very experienced, then maybe you should just stick to more simpler strategies and not use leverage because that will minimize the amount of risk that you're taking. And you can also, of course, start out with very small amounts. That's really great about crypto is that you know, you don't have to buy a whole Bitcoin or, or things like that. You could, you could start with a couple dollars really, and then try out what you, what you want. The best website or way to generate a private key on a brand new device. Um, definitely don't use a website. Uh, you do not want. Uh, your private key on an online device, ideally. I mean, it will be on an online dev device if you use something like a phone or a, a network laptop, but you definitely don't want it in a web browser. Um, so, you know, a private key is just a very long number. The The most, I would say, private way you, you can generate one is by taking a coin, uh, flipping it 256 times, and noting down heads or tails for each flip. And uh, then, you know, you could say heads are one, tails are zeros. So you will convert, you know, what you've written down into ones and zeros. And that gives you a binary private key, which you can then, uh, you know, import into a wallet. Um, oh, and, and just below here, sorry. What is the safer site to generate paper wallet? I definitely wouldn't do that myself. Uh, paper wallets are quite insecure. Um, you know, your best just generating it offline. All right, 
so we have a question from Twitter, Zabidi. When exactly is the support or resistance broken and how can you determine how hard the price will go up or down? How does volume correlate to this? Um, so the first part of this question, when when is a support or resistance level broken? I mean, that kind of depi depends on how you define it in your own strategy. So um, many traders will use high, high time frame candlestick closes. So let's say a four hour, well, I mean, a four hour is in high time frame, but higher time frame but as i said it really depends on the strategy but let's say they will look for a four hour or a daily or a weekly close above or below a support or resistance level and that could act as a confirmation for for breaking the level because what can happen a lot of the time is that the price will wick over or above a support or resistance level and then immediately goes back to to the previous level and so then it effectively is what is called a fake out or just some other type of um, event that usually happens because large traders want to fill their positions and then they will look for these pockets sort of on the chart that will have more liquidity and so they kind of um, they expect that if a support or resistance level is broken, then many traders will many uh, traders stop losses will trigger, and also breakout traders will jump on the opportunity. So there are these multiple factors that play into a large uh, amount of liquidity at a level, and so if a large trader wants to fill their position without affecting the price much. They will look for these uh, zones where the liquidity will be higher. And so this is why these wicks happen sometimes. They happen a lot with Bitcoin, actually, especially on, on lower time frames, because it's relatively easy to, to bounce the price around with higher, with many high leverage positions. So, yeah, um, but so to actually give you an answer, it's it really depends on on your own strategy. So if you define what constitutes as a support or resistance level breaking in your in your own strategy, then then you should stick to it all across the board and then uh, you can use it in your strategy. So I think here consistency is what is important and so the second part of the question is how does volume correlate so i talked a little bit about this is that these volume spikes are usually uh, happening because there's a lot of liquidity at a certain level and then this is why these are sort of areas of interest for many traders and of course if a support or resistance level is broken on high volume that's that can act as a confirmation of um, of the pattern breaking or the support or resistance level breaking. And when it breaks with lower volume, then it may be a less valid signal. Can you explain layer two solutions as I'm five? So state channels, plasma and sharding and others I don't know. Um, yeah, we'll give it a go. Uh, layer two uh, basically involves, you know, protocols that are kind of anchored in the blockchain, but all of the information, uh, you know, that gets transmitted while it is, you know, kind of connected to the blockchain, it's not actually published to the blockchain. So these are uh, mainly scalability improvements, because uh, you know, as you know, every node has to download the blockchain. So the less amount of information in the blockchain, the better, uh, you know, the better, the easier it is, sorry, to download. Um, so state channels are uh, channels that you kind of open with a transaction in the blockchain uh, and that kind of opens a, like yeah like a channel or kind of a tunnel between you and a peer uh, and you can pass messages transactions back and forth without publishing it uh, and you'll use some kind of cryptographic mechanism to ensure that no one's cheating and then you'll publish a second transaction on the blockchain at a later date 
to close it and uh you know that will close the channel and the rest of the chain doesn't need to know what's been going on so say you made five thousand transactions back and forth between a peer uh you would just have two transactions appear to the network so the one on the blockchain that opened the network and the one on the blockchain that closed it uh plasma is another scalability uh development i'm not as familiar with this but it involves uh it's well it's more of a framework at the moment i don't believe there's been any significant development where uh or sorry no significant implementation where you have kind of uh branches of child chains uh which kind of branch off from the blockchain the principle is the same they externalize all of that information and lastly sharding involves breaking up uh you know the distributed network and the kind of neighborhoods if you want and these neighborhoods will share information with themselves and then uh they'll only pass limited information to you know the broader network outside that specific neighborhood mickey c sorry to belabor the point that's no problem uh but do you personally use paper wallets i'm not comfortable with them due to having roommates uh we wouldn't recommend paper wallets uh note that when i say paper wallet uh i don't mean writing down your seed you know it's important to have a backup um but you know generating a, a wallet in a web browser to print off uh no I, I don't think that's a good idea yeah we re we rarely recommend things but using a paper wallet is probably not a great idea so that tells you what we think about it so oh you want to take the next one as well go ahead i i'll go for it uh mr njene by entering binary number into what please explain how we get the public and private key afterwards um sorry was this in reference to the uh, the binary um you would convert you know, what a lot of people do is keep a private key in hexadecimal. So you convert binary to hexadecimal. That's a 64, um, 64 character key. But, uh, you know, I would, if, if you're unfamiliar with that, I would say, you know, your better option is just to use something like a hardware wallet if you're really trying to achieve that level of security. Um, or alternatively, you could look at something like uh, the, you know, the word list that you use for mnemonic seeds, uh, the, bit 39 outlines that uh and then you would you know use a sufficient source of randomness to pick 12 or 24 words off that and you would write them down and then you could import them into wallet software okay super hit which leverage is perfect to trade 20x um there's no perfect leverage amount um just <laughs> i think a general guideline is probably as low as possible because there's then less risk of liquidation so um probably um if you can add more funds to the exchange and use lower leverage that's typically not a bad idea because obviously the higher the leverage is the higher the chance that you will get liquidated so we have another question from Harold. Sorry for bombarding with questions. No problem. I mean, this is why we're here. I'm sure you guys heard of Coinbase preparing an IPO. May I ask your thoughts regarding that? Um, yes, it's an interesting development. It's, I mean, it's great. It's definitely going to bring more legitimacy to the cryptocurrency space. And um, we hope we're going to be seeing more IPOs uh, regarding blockchain and cryptocurrency. I know that there were a few that were relating to mining companies, but I don't think, I mean, I don't think there were any major or even smaller cryptocurrency exchanges that IPO'd or, or are listed on the stock market. So it's an interesting development. And something else I also wonder about is whether they are going to tokenize at least some of their equity in some way that would be interesting to see to maybe 
um, try and harvest what blockchain is capable of. But yeah, that's uh, we'll see. But but that's uh, definitely that that would be interesting. Or it for personally, for me personally, it would be quite interesting to see if if these tokenization efforts will go anywhere in the near future. We have a question coming from Twitter. How do you determine if technical analysis is working on a trading pair? What would be the minimum requisite to be able to do it? Um, you know, as we kind of touched on in the presentation, uh, you know, it's a game of probabilities. Uh, you know, you could tell if your technical analysis was working, if you're kind of consistently doing well in your trades. Uh, okay, so next one. Affiliate wallet ran off with my NEO funds. Trusting wallets is one of the crappiest parts of maintaining and secure securing funds. Um, yes, I mean, <laughs> that's, that's not great. Uh, I mean, uh, try to use <laughs> trusted software. I mean, it's quite difficult because crypto is kind of this wild west of software in a way where where there's a lot of different options and in many cases there aren't necessarily clear winners or or clear sort of go-to choices so so yeah it's always nice to to do research on on different products and services that you use and also from crypto chick can you discuss magd crossover strategy i prefer swing trading and anything that's fit my style you use 12 hour daily weekly so i mean the magd crossover strategy it could work on any time frame essentially so it's not it doesn't necessarily have to be swing trades many day traders will use magd as well or magd crossovers I mean, it could even work on a one minute chart, but if you do prefer swing trading, then sure, you could use the daily, weekly, 12 hour. I mean, it really depends on what kind of setups you're looking for. Um, and it can also really help um, to to look at multiple time frames and, and, um, and just try to get more information about the market like that. But yeah, the basic idea of a crossover strategy is to to um, to you know buy when there is a bullish crossover and sell when there is a bearish crossover. That's like the very sort of the very concise way of putting it. And so, if you are actually generating trade ideas based on a crossover strategy like this, that is on a specific time frame, let's say. It's on the daily chart and so if there is a bullish crossover in the daily chart and you buy that then according to this strategy you'd need to sell when there is a bearish crossover in the daily chart but if there is a bearish crossover on the four hour chart then that's not really a sell signal in your framework so uh yeah it, you can you can basically use any any time frame, but the important thing is to stick to it. Were you guys also surprised at the power of TikTok on pumping Dogecoin? Yes, yeah, we were we were quite surprised. <laughs> yes, Dogecoin is uh is one of the og coins so to say it's quite an old name many people know about it and uh, it's easy to get the brand i guess of dogecoin compared to other cryptocurrencies which are fairly techy so in simple words it's very difficult to create 
a private key or public key by ourselves and we have to trust third party ledger. I know the seeds are ours, uh, but still the third party companies can add something in their software. Yes, so that is a problem. Um, you know, proprietary software, you don't know what's going on. Uh, you don't know what it's doing. Um, so typically, uh, you know, if, if I'm assessing wallet software, I'll look to see if it's open source uh, and, you know, what, what people have said about this open source, um, you know, just to make sure there's nothing, you know, malicious going on there. Um, you know, I just, I wouldn't recommend creating a private key, you know, solely by yourself if you're not very familiar with how to do it, just because it could result in the risk of funds. So, you know, the second best is to go with open source stuff or go with, you know, rely, like uh, software that a lot of people rely on talking well about. Okay, so we have two somewhat related questions. Hello, what would be a winning percentage up to take gains from a position, please? 50% up, then wait for 5% down for re-entering set position. Okay, so this one is about compounding trades and some traders use use this strategy where they enter positions, they take profits at certain levels um, and then they wait for a pullback and they, um, they re-enter with those profits again when there's a dip, if it's a long position. And so then they try to compound their gains over multiple trades. Um, so it really depends on the trade setup. So I think it's more um, useful to think about these in terms of market structure and and price action and, and technicals. If you're if you're uh, trading technicals, which these percentage numbers are. And so just trying to go for particular percentage targets is probably not as useful as just observing what's happening and then determining your targets based on that. Because obviously the market doesn't care about percentage levels that much. It just cares about um, whatever it cares about, really, whatever determines uh, the price discovery at that point. But um, so, yeah, the short answer is it's more about market structure and not percentage levels. And the second question, what is the best percentage allocation of trading funds to leave and re-enter positions? Um, it's it, it again depends on the individual setup. I mean, I'm, <laughs> this is kind of a non answer, but the reason I'm saying it is because it's very hard to to tell these in isolation. And so what may work in one trade setup won't in another one. And so it's always about actually reading the market and observing what's happening and then deciding um, deciding these allocations based on that. And so if you're sizing your positions based on risk management principles, then that will also help you determine these levels. <laughs> when launchpad we we don't know we we're, we write uh, articles for academy so <laughs> we don't decide about other parts of the ecosystem yeah we did we did say we'd give you a, a hint about the quiz so we'll be hosting uh another quiz next week if you're familiar with the ones we've been hosting on twitter where we have uh, a question every hour the answer is hidden somewhere in uh, one of our articles so we'll uh we'll let you know now in advance that the next topic will be to do with uh privacy so make sure to check out the privacy articles oh yeah okay thanks harold for the nice words 
glad to help. And do you, we, do we have a set date for the next webinar? Um, we usually have it once a month. Today is the 10th of July, I believe. So around that, but we definitely should be more uh, predictable with the schedule. So we'll try to do that, but we have it once a month and it's usually um, in the first half of the month. Yeah, and you know, we, we love to hear your, your feedback in the chat on what kind of topics you'd like to see discussed, you know, for webinars, for articles. So you have any ideas, send them through. Alrighty, so it's been more than an hour. So I think, and we don't have any more questions. So I think uh, we'll end this stream here. And then hopefully we'll see you guys in a month. Thank you for joining. All right, thanks for joining and thanks for the great questions. It was really fun.